Good morning, everyone, and uh, Happy New Year. Blessed New Year, to be more precise. Uh, let me set up the screen, and then uh, I'll start sharing with you this morning. This morning, our topic will be, it is a relationship. Of course, we are referring to uh, our relationship with God, uh, or more precisely, we call it Christian living which we are all called to do. The moment we come to know the Lord Jesus Christ, our life is transformed to live according to the authority of the Bible and to follow it and to act it. So I have entitled this, It is a Relationship. The text I like to take from is actually from Acts chapter 2, verse 42 to 46. But before we start, earlier on, uh, it was already read to us by Li Wei uh, from Mark chapter 12, which is our theme for this year. And the theme is back to basics. I think we should not be just only hearing it being mentioned during worship or during prayer, corporate prayer, but it should be in our mind very, very clearly. And for this reason, uh, I like to highlight the theme. This is the second week, but to highlight this. Let me read to us again what is written in Mark 12, 29 to 31. This was the answer that Jesus gave to the questions of the Pharisees or the teachers of the law at that time. He gave this answer. They were asking him, coming to him and asking, what is the most important commandment? And Jesus answered, the most important one is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Our God is the only one true living God. And then he went on further then to put into application it's just not about knowledge that we know. Our God is the living God. Our God is a great God and almighty God. He went on and he emphasized this because this was missing in their life. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strengths. It tells us that we can do things without loving God. Good works. And all religion teach good works. But down here, it's talking about we have to love God and not just love him when we can, love him when we feel like it or when things go on well, but all the time. And not 90%, but 100%. I know in some of our minds, we just say how to love God 100%. But that should be the vision we capture. We give everything we have to do that. And whether we reach that or not, it's up to God to judge because he will know the effort we put in. Then after he answered them, he said, love God with everything that you have, all right, with your heart, with your soul, with your mind, and with your strength, which uh, Roy has already emphasized for us already. Then he said something else. This second, the second one is this, love your neighbor as yourself. I don't need to emphasize neighbor means love Everybody, love everybody. This was the answer Jesus gave to the Pharisees. He gave this answer because he wanted to correct their faulty perspective. Their perspective was that Christianity is just a religion, a set of laws that we should observe with no reference to relationship at all. Obey the law, obey the law, keep the law. Even on the Sabbath, don't talk about love, don't talk about relationship, don't talk about our attitudes and everything, but just keep the law. That was one of the 40 perspectives they have. They saw Christian living as a religion. They also saw Christian living as religiosity. That means how to look pious. By keeping the law, we become pious. We look pious. We look very holy. But inside us may be devoid of any relationship with God 
and with people. So Christian relationship, Christian living is a relationship. One that starts first by falling deeply in love with God. That's the first step. So he said that commandments are love the Lord. Our God is one, but love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul. You fall in love with God deeply. That is the starting point. And then out of that, out of that relationship with God, we also learn to love, allow God to love through us, allowing God to love through us other people, our Christian friends, brothers and sisters, but more than that, our neighbors, the pre-believers, the people who, who are enemies, we are to do that. It is all about a relationship, building a relationship with God and with others. Our relationship with God and with people cannot be separated. Let me repeat. Our relationship with God and people cannot be separated. They go together always. Because one without the other will result in turning Christian living into a religion or just religiosity, just being religious. So they cannot be separated. I chose the passage from Acts chapter 2, verse 42. And allow me just to read to you. Because from here, you will see there are six basic steps. Our team is back to basics. To me, I interpreted it, and I don't think I'm wrong. What Roy wanted to tell us is, understand this, that if, if you distill down to the bottom line, this should be our Christian living. It's not about what we are you know, planning for, what events we have, and what church is like, and everything. But this is the very basic, and it's to take place throughout our lives. It reads this way. The early disciples, they devoted themselves to the apostle teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of the bread and prayer. Apostle teaching here means the authority of God's word. The apostles were people who have seen and experienced Jesus themselves. So when they thought there were authority in the word, today our authority is in the Bible. So they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayer. Everyone was filled with awe and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. Selling their possessions and goods. It was not that they had, then they gave to each other. It's not that of the excess. It's not that they want to change their wardrobe or they want a new pair of shoes and I have extra, I give away. If you read carefully, there was not enough. There was not enough to go around. And maybe they wanted to give something, but they could not because they don't have it. So they sell their possessions and goods and they give to anyone who has need. Anyone who has need. Every day they continue to meet together in the temple because today it will be our church. It's a formal gathering. It's a corporate gathering, temple cost. They broke bread in their homes also and act together with glad and sincere heart, praising God and enjoying the favor of the people. And out of this Christian living style, the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Before I move on to the sixth basic, I want to say something here. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. It's preceded by us living the Christian life as mentioned in the above verses. When we live that life and we focus upon that carefully and we take care of that, the Lord will add to our numbers. We have a part to play. We have influence upon the people around us, impacting them. And then the Lord 
God's love will be seen by them and the Lord will convict them of salvation and they will come to know the Lord. This is what it means by Jesus. Said, First, love the Lord, your God, with all your heart. And then he said, next is to love your neighbor as yourself. Acts chapter 2 to me fulfills or run parallels to what Mark chapter 12 is talking about, our team. My desire, my objective is not to preach good messages, but that we role model this. But there are six things that we need to role model. There are six basics basic that we need to look into. For Christian living, I call six basic. The first is Bible reading. Bible reading. Bible reading is foundational for our relationship with God. Because we learn about God, we communicate. It's our main way. Other than that, without Bible reading, your communication or your thinking and your reading of the Bible, all right, must be tailored to say, I need to know about God. I need to know about God. Bible reading is important because we see the love of God. We see the love of God. It's the authority. It tells us everything about God. And when we see the love of God, we respond to that. That's why it builds a relationship. It's about a relationship. Bible reading is not for knowledge. Bible reading is for relationship because we learn the character of God. Because we learn how to relate to one another. It tells us how to relate with our parents. It tells us how to relate with our enemies. It tells us how to relate with everybody, with our enemies and everything. It tells us how to relate. You see, it's everything about relationship. Christian living is about relationship. We need to read the Bible because it's foundation, because by reading it and when we accept it, when we accept it and when we see it, and it is the authority of God's word. It is the final authority on all subjects. When we do that, we experience transformation. We experience transformation. We discern what God wants to do daily. And therefore, we say, read your Bible daily. It's not for knowledge. It's not for interpretation. It's not for discussion. That won't get us very far. So read the Bible. Without the Bible, you cannot form a relationship with God. It's just religion. It's just a chanting, a prayer or chanting some words. Verse 42 very clearly tells us something. Now, you know, the word devoted, devoted, means they devoted themselves. First, they devoted themselves. It was not a casual reading. It was not once in a while or when I have time. It's not a rushed reading. It is not the quantity of reading. The word devoted, when you find it in the Bible, or when it's used in the Bible, it means zealously going after it. Do we do that? Do we zealously pick up the Bible and say, I need to read God's word. I need to know what is it all about. I need to know the character of God. I need to know how to relate to others. Zealously reading it. They were keen about it. Not half-hearted. Oh no, I got something to do not right now. Uh, this is my Christian duty to read the Bible every day. I've been taught that and I must do that. Is that what it means? No. It's not casual. It's not reluctance but it's zealous, it's keen, it's intense. It's about not just studying it, but intensely and passionate about it. To put it in a simple everyday word, I cannot leave the day without reading God's word. Of course we can leave, but will we leave to the honor of God? Will we leave so that our life will exemplify what Acts chapter 2, verse 42 onwards says about that. So we don't do it out of duty. We accept it as authority. And so Bible reading is indispensable for Christian living. Are you reading the word of God? 
Or sometimes I ask myself when I read the word of God, sometimes I get frightened because when I read it, I already have a mindset of my own. I read, maybe you read the daily bread, uh, you know, every day with Jesus and all that. There's nothing wrong with that. Read that, but clearly read the word of God first and say, Lord, what have you to say to me? That's what I mean, Bible reading. So the first basic is Bible reading. We must read it, read it daily. Otherwise, at the end of the day, we come back, our prayer will be, Lord, forgive me, for I've gone through the day without your guidance. I've lived the day without your guidance. Forgive me. The next is application. Application. Verse 44 says, all the believers were together and had everything in common. In such an environment, you cannot help but be relating to each other. Application. Reading all the word of God without putting it into practice ends up being, again, religion or just religiosity. We can quote Bible verse and all that, but we don't put it into application. So Bible reading must go with application. Now I'm going to mention six basics and they don't necessarily, say, I'm not necessarily saying it must go in that order, but I will just say they will go together. All right, they just go together. In 2016, I know this is six years back already by now, but it makes very little difference in terms of years. George Barna survey. George Barna survey is very well accepted because uh, it is done well and it has credibility. He made a survey of the Christian in US. This is in US in 2016. And it's very interesting. 73% from that survey in number, 73% of them reads the Bible. That's not bad. That's three quarter percent. They actually read the Bible. But then also he found out a very small percentage, a very small percentage of them practice or apply what they learned from the Bible. How many percent do you think it was? How many percent? Was it 30%? Not bad. If it's 30%. And I tell you it's wrong. So what percentage would you say again? Let's have it. 15%. Was it 15%? No. The real result showed only 2%. Of the 73% who read the Bible every day, applied what they read. Today in Singapore, let's ask ourselves, would we be, are we any better? Are we really any better? From your experience of yourself and with our church and with other Christians, we know everybody kind of read the Bible or we assume, but how many of us apply? Would it be more than 2%? I think we will not be very far from this number. Otherwise, the living together, the sharing of everything, the selling of possession, the meeting of one as everyone has needs would be more evident in our homes, and in church. So my take is, I don't think we are very far from that. Application is important because reading the Bible faithfully without application or saying that, oh, this doesn't apply to our present age or our age is different and everything. We are nullifying the authority in the first place and not only nullify the authority, in so doing, we are depriving everything that it is saying, and we end up just changing Christian living into a religion. People 
are attracted to relationship. People are not attracted to events. People are not attracted to religiosity. Molly and myself, we have a neighbor who says, when we talk a little, try to witness to her, she says, you know what? I'm not against religion. I am a religious person. I am a religious person, but it doesn't matter to her who she prays to. And being an Indian, of course, she just prayed to the Hindu God. And she won't object to Christianity. She will accept all that we teach and say that it's good teaching. You see, Bible reading without application is just changing it into a religion or religiosity. Salvation often comes, I said earlier already, but salvation often comes as a result of our relationship with our friends and neighbors. So we build upon relationship, but don't stop there. Don't stop there. We must apply it. And when they see apply it, then God will bring about salvation. The close relationship, all right? This close relationship of the believers is described in this way. Selling their possessions and goods they gave to anyone as he had need. Anyone and selling is the key word here. Every day they continue to meet together in the temple courts. Every day they were doing that. The, I, I put First Peter 8 to 10 there is because to me it is just, uh, 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 you know, the same thing that is talking about. It's the equivalent of the practice. The instruction is given over and over in, in God's word. It says, above all, love each other deeply because love covers a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. I will be talking about sincerity and integrity. This is what he's talking about. You know, I can offer hospitality with grumbling and with grousing. I can offer hospitality, can't wait to get rid of people because they are just not fitting into me. Each one, clearly everyone can do it, should use whatever gift he has received to serve others. Faithfully administering God's grace in its various form. That's the equivalent of the application of Acts chapter 2. Selling the possession and everything. So we need to be reading the Bible and applying it, taking it as a final authority, no ifs on anything and living that. You call it radical living? Yes. The next is supplication. Supplication is, of course, prayer. And we pray because God knows every situation. Otherwise, why do we go to God? Because God knows every situation, not only knows every situation, He knows it better than us. In Henry Blackaby's book, Experiencing God, he writes it this way. He said, God is always at work and already at work. So it's not just only our act that touches people. God already wants salvation to come to these people, but he used us as a means to show that the Bible is the final authority and the correction that they need to think in their perspective. God is already at work. I put it this way. Reading the Bible, God speaks to us. God tells us what needs to be done, what his commandments are, how we are to do and everything. But in prayer, we speak to God. Now, that's a relationship. You cannot have a relationship that is only a one-way traffic. It's a two-way communication. Reading the Bible to me is literally one way. God is just giving me clear-cut instruction, reminding me of his promises, and I learn a lot of things. It's God telling me, God telling me, God telling me, God telling me. And maybe we get frustrated with that because we have never added prayer where I can speak to God and I can tell God, God, my situation is unique. What do you want me to say? What do you want me to do? In other words, prayer is 
talking to God and listening to God, where God replies. We speak and we listen for God's replies. Our corporate prayer meeting must include listening for God replies. We often pray over a subject and then we give our opinions instead of listening for God's reply. It is only in this way that we grow in intimacy with God. That we come to know our God and we come to experience our God. When we sit and wait, he replies and listen to his reply. This is a two-way communication that develops intimacy. I don't have to go down the line about husband and wife. If I'm always talking to Molly all the time and she's not listening, there will be no intimacy. But her response to that makes it important. Bible reading, application, supplication, and next, integrity. Integrity is indispensable. Allow me to read again and highlight the words that caught my attention. Every day they continued. It's not just once, but every day they continued. It was consistent to meet together in the temple courts. You know, we now have on-site meeting only once a month. I think we should do our very best not to miss that opportunity. We have already mentioned the advantage and why it is. But they met together every day in temple courts. That means in a formal manner, they broke bread in their homes and all together, you know, and act together with glad and sincere heart is the one I mentioned earlier, sincere heart. And I link it to being having integrity. When they praise God, it was with integrity. It's not just mouth service only. And therefore, they enjoy the favor of everyone. Being sincere, they were able, all right, to have a very consistent life. In and out was the life at home and the life in church is the same. Their life in the office and the life at home or in the church is the same thing. Their life on Mondays and their life on Sunday are the same thing. That's integrity. Integrity is indispensable. They continue doing it. Consistent lifestyle. They kept their objectives. Objectives of what? Of meeting together, of eating together. They were focused. They were not just eating together all the time. The objective is that we build our relationship. It's a bonding, not just between men and men, but it's a bonding by helping another to bond with God, to worship God, to praise God. Our sharing should be about how God has blessed us. Our sharing is how I need God, how I need, need to depend upon God. So it was not just talking about anything, and therefore it was that kind of integrity that we are talking about. Now, without integrity of the heart, our relationship would be superficial. Everything would be superficial. And there will be little impact and influence in the lives of others. We can have evangelistic program and everything, but we do it for the sake of an event. It's not about sharing. It's not about selling possession. It's not about using the gifts that each of us have. It's not consistent. It's not continuous. We need only three events or we need only two events in a year. We plan that and all the rest of the time, we are not thinking about it. Integrity means I am so concerned for the lost. I will not miss any opportunity. I will continue to do it because my heart's sincerity tells me they need God. And when we do that, then the Lord will add to our numbers daily those who are being saved. 
is always two ways. We living the Christian life with the basics in place and God using those occasion to convict people of sin and of judgment and of righteousness. But that's not enough. It's everything about your own, yourself only. There is a third, another factor that is called the communion. Communion, I'm not talking about Lord's Supper, but it is about the individual having communion with God, re- having a relationship with God. No isolation. There is no isolated Christians. We are a community from the very, very start. In fact, God demonstrated it. You have the Holy Spirit, you have Jesus, the Son, and you have God, the Father. It's a community. It's a communion. Relationship can only exist when there is a community. You can be a monk and go to the mountain. There is no relationship. It's only a deception that I have a relationship with God. But then there is no application of everything. If God said, be humble. If God said, uh, be kind. And you just continue to remain in the mountain top and everything without a community. There is no relationship, no real relationship. It's just a religion. In a community, we live, we learn, and we grow together. We make mistakes. We forgive one another. We encourage one another. We correct one another. We bring one another closer to God. In a community, we apply, all right? We apply what is needed from the Bible. We read the Bible and we apply it in a community. There is accountability in there. We share our needs authentically. I use the word authentically because I want to link it to integrity, transparency. We share our needs. We speak and we ask for prayer because of the temptation I face or you face. Or we speak of the sin I've fallen into and ask for prayer and for forgiveness and for you to hold me to walk back into the right road. We seek help without fear or judgment. Why is it so difficult for us sometimes to ask for prayer? Why is it we sometimes say, don't share with anybody, but just pray for me on this. Is that reflective of the community that is found in Acts 2? Is that Christian living when I fear judgment? So I believe in authenticity. I believe in transparency and openness. We learn, we live, we learn, and we grow together. Then finally, we serve. Service. All the believers were together and had everything in common. The service comes in selling their possessions and goods, and they get to anyone as need. Practical service. It is very obvious that they were serving one another. And it was extended to the neighbors. It's not just about service to some people we like your name. It's extended to the neighbors, anyone, pre-believers included. Their service, if you notice carefully and you read it over again and reflect upon it and meditate upon it, their service was sacrificial. The emphasis of our team for this year, 2022, should not end in 2022. But the emphasis is to begin, all right, with Mark chapter 12. The emphasis is this, to pay attention to our relationship with God first and our relationship with one another. 
and never trade that relationship with God for serving. While I talk about service is important, but quite often we turn it the other way around, isn't it? We get people to serve without concern about their relationship at home, without concern about their relationship at the workplace. We're just interested in them serving. Don't treat the relationship for anything or for serving. While I'm not saying we should not serve, but don't treat it. Don't treat your serving as you are serving right now. All right? For relationship. What I mean is don't give up the relationship. Maintain your relationship. Watch your relationship. Don't become so overwhelmed with so many things to do to the point that I will not read the Bible, to the point is that I will not spend too much time relating, but I will show myself serving faithfully in church. In my area with uh, those people in my mentoring group, we use this thing that serve out of our being. Being precedes come before doing. Or in a more negative way, we say, all right, service flows out of the being. If the heart is not there, service is superficial. If the relationship is not there, service is just for show. Religion, religiosity. Being precedes doing, pay attention to the relationship as you serve, whenever you serve. In conclusion, these are the six, six basics I find for Christian living. There's actually a Latin phrase, and I, I didn't bother to put it down here, but a, a, a phrase that teaches and it's found in most Reformed church, which is a very good phrase, that we need to reform. We need to reform periodically. Now, it doesn't mean change. What it means, as time passes, that phrase means as time passes, all right, we must examine to see if we are still relevant and impacting society. We must see if we are relevant and still impacting our neighbors. It says we need to examine that. We need to go back to this basic, that's why I say, and examine it. We need to examine our doctrines. Why do I believe what I believe? Why do I do what I do? To make sure that we don't fall into a religion. We need to go back every now. Now, it does not mean when it just said we need to reform every once in a while, especially in one generation to the next. It doesn't mean that we have to become more innovative, we become more creative, we must keep on changing with times and everything. That's not what it means. It means with passing time, we must come back to basics. With passing time, we need to look into it just like in today in X. Maybe the call to back to basic is really what God has put in our heart. But we need to examine, are we practicing it? We need to do that. Have we deviated from it? Can you imagine if Acts chapter 2, those few verses, happens in home small group? Just home, small group. And the Lord can add. Now, I'll be very blunt. How many of you have invited friends to join us, whether by Zoom or on site? How many of you have? What is the issue of it? Can you see a wave 
that flows in every home small group start with a relationship with one another, not only your home small group, but with your neighbor. Can you see the flow, that the wave that will come? And it will not be that the church will be filled with people, but each home will be filled with two or three person. And if the attendance in, in, in each group just goes up by one or two or by three, do you see what God can do by adding to our numbers? I believe it can happen. I believe if home facilitators, home host, I believe if leaders model, role model this, don't talk about it. Role model the six basic. Even in mentoring groups. Even in youth gathering, women's gathering, men's gathering. Our small group, are we reading the Bible? Are we teaching and are we taking as authority? Are we seeing each other? You know, at the end of this message here right now, which is the end, I just want to emphasize that, you know, you don't just discuss, but you apply it. And I, I think you can apply things if you can memorize. So one of, the, one of the, the key thing that you're going to do is to memorize the verse of Mark chapter 12. Memorize it. You don't have to be word perfect, but at least we need to remember, where does the Bible insist that teaches us that we should do all this? Mark chapter 12, Acts chapter 2. We tell ourselves that. And when you can remember that, then you apply it. Since it's telling me that, Am I applying it? We must ask ourselves constantly every day. If there is integrity, there will always be the continuation of it. And we have to pray for one another. So I'm going to ask for you in your time also to share what is one step that you can take today, this week, before we meet next week. One small step to move on so that we are back to basic. And then we pray for one another. This is what back to basic means to me. Nothing fanciful, nothing new. But that's what the word of God says. Basics. Let's go back to it. Let us pray. We ask Lord, for you to examine us frequently. We ask a lot that the skills from our eyes will fall and we will see clearly the life, the Christian living you want us to live because we know that will honor and glorify you. Forgive us, Lord, that we are filled with knowledge, but seldom, Lord, with application. Forgive us, Lord, that every now and then, the busyness of this world take us from reading your word. And even when we do, and we seriously meet it, Lord, we need to apply them. The deception that is not the absolute authority. And we adopt a worldview. Forgive us for that. And we thank you and we praise you, Lord, that every day, according to your word, is a new day. Wake us up, Lord, with a prayer of saying, Thank you, Lord, that I'm breathing, I'm alive. But, Lord, more important, show us. Open our eyes to opportunity. Help us to live a life that will bring others closer to you. Be it our brothers and sisters, be it fathers or mothers, be it people, the non-Christian. We ask, Lord, that we do and we live our life in integrity. This 
I pray for all of us in Jesus' most precious name. Amen.